What I'm about to explain to you will completely change your understanding of fine tuning and give you a 10 times clearer understanding of what fine tuning is, why we do it, and how you can use it for your own purposes. Fine tuning is such a powerful and crucial role in the entire AI and large language model ecosystem that I wanna make sure all of you are 100% clear on what it's for and why we do it. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. On my recent fine tuning video, which will be available here, I got a lot of questions from the community and I started to realize that a lot of people don't actually understand what fine tuning is and why we do it. So I thought I'd hop on here today and give you guys a, a quick explainer and sort of demystifying video talking about what fine tuning is, why we're doing it, give some examples of how we can apply it to businesses so that you're hundred percent crystal clear and you understand this key aspect of large language models and artificial intelligence. The first reason that your fine tunes may suck is because you're expecting chat GPT like output from your GPT-3 fine tunes. Now, I must admit that I too was fooled by this initially and it took me a little while to fully understand that what we are interacting with in the API through the GPT-3 API is not the same as what we're interacting with on ChatGPT. You've got to understand that ChatGPT is an application that has been built by OpenAI on top of GPT-3. GPT-3 essentially functions as a huge autocomplete engine and it's able to do a bunch of different tasks because of that. What OpenAI have done with ChatGPT is I added a ton of reinforcement learning and fine tuning on top of the GPT-3 underlying large language model in order to get it to this really conversational and excellent experience that we all are familiar with. Unfortunately, what we have access to through the APIs and that we're able to fine tune is not the same as ChatGPT. Therefore, when we make calls to the GPT-3 API, we're not gonna get back nice chatbot style dialogue from it. It is just raw autocomplete response from GPT-3. What you may have noticed is that when you're querying your fine-tuned model, it may either get cut short by its token limit or ramble on endlessly. And this is because there's so many different variables that you can change and tweak in order to get the large language model, which is GPT-3, in order to reach the final product. And say, if you're trying to make a chatbot like ChatGPT, there's so much work that goes in between what you have access to in the raw format versus the final output that you're probably looking for. So in summary, the first reason that your fine tunes may suck is because you are expecting ChatGPT-like output out of the raw language model that is GPT-3 that we have access to programming. And now the second and what I think is the most likely reason that your fine tunes suck is because you don't properly understand the fine tuning process and why we do it. The biggest misconception that I see around fine tuning today and something that I myself fell prey to as well is that fine tuning is meant to onboard more data into a model, essentially to teach a model new things. This is incorrect. The fine tuning process is actually intended to help a model recognize new patterns and respond to those patterns appropriately. That's right. Fine tuning is not meant to teach a model new stuff. It is absolutely crucial that you understand fine tuning as pattern recognition training. Here's a super simple example of fine tuning on a simple task. Say you have an online business and you're hiring at the moment and you're receiving tons and tons of resumes from people all over the world with many different formats, but you're getting all of these resumes into your inbox all the time. These resumes from different people obviously don't have any strict format, so the information of the person can be scattered all over the document in many different places and formats. You could take all of these documents and scrape the PDF for all the data that you could find. If you scraped all of these PDFs, there wouldn't be any uniform structure to the data that you receive. Now, say you wanted to take all of that complicated and, and messy unstructured data from the PDFs and then reformat it to be really easy and understand so that you can input that data directly into your backend systems. What you could do is create a spreadsheet with two columns. The first one containing the unstructured data from the PDFs and the second one containing that data, but structured how you'd like it to be. With each row representing one person, you could get a VA to go through all of these and essentially restructure the unstructured data into the format that you would like and repeat this for the entire 100 or 200 rows that you have. What you would then have is hundreds of rows of prompt and completion pairs that you can funnel into the GPT-3 model through the fine tuning process that I cover in my fine tuning video, which will be linked up here. Because you now have this fine tuned model, you can call it programmatically. And whenever you get new resumes that come in, you can take the unstructured data that you scrape from their PDF, from their resume, put it through your fine tuned model and get it out in a nice structured way that you wanted it in the first place and then put that directly into your systems. This can easily be done by integrating it with Zapier or something similar. Another example could be sentiment analysis. Say for example, if you were a social media marketing agency and you were looking to track the overall sentiment on one of your Instagram or Facebook ads or on all of the ads that you're running at the moment, you could find tune GPT-3 to become an expert at classifying the sentiment of social media comments. To do this, you'd need to scrape a few thousand social media comments from Facebook or Instagram and then put them in a spreadsheet the same way that we did with the previous example and have all of the data in one column and then a sentiment label in the other. If you get a virtual assistant to go through and label them all as positive or negative or neutral, once you have all that data labeled, you can then funnel it into the GPT-3 model through the fine tuning process. And you've essentially made GPT-3 sort of an expert at sentiment classification for social media comment. 
this is useful because social media comments are a little bit different to the typical kind of text that GPT-3 is used to predict the sentiment on. So the nuances of what makes a, a positive or negative or neutral comment on social media may be different to the kind of language that it's used to seeing on blog posts or any other sort of internet archive material that it has access to. As a social media marketing agency, you could then use that fine tune model programmatically to begin sorting through all of the comments on your social media ads and then determining an overall like, aggregate a sentiment score for each of your ads to determine how they're performing and what the reception is from the people you're displaying these ads to. So notice how in both of these models, we are not trying to teach the model any new data. We are simply getting it to recognize a pattern and respond in a certain way. We are making it better at a very specific task. So now you may be thinking, okay, how can I put more data into these models to expand their knowledge for other purposes? Now, this is a very hot topic in artificial intelligence and large language models at the moment because there's a token limit on how much information you can put into a, a API request. How can we include other data sources while working within this 4,000 token limit that we have on models like GPT-3? Now, one option that you have to expand the knowledge of your model with new data is called semantic search. Now, this is quite a complex topic and I, I don't think I can cover it fully in the, the scope of this video, but I'll give you a quick rundown so you know what I'm talking about. Semantic search essentially allows you to take in a corpus of text data. Say you have tons and tons of PDFs of books by a certain author or legal documents. You can take that corpus of text data, put it through a specific function that you can get access to through libraries programmatically. But essentially these functions are going to vectorize all of the information, chop it up, chunk it up, and then put it into a multi-dimensional vectoring system so that it sort of tags what the content of these different chunks of data is and then remembers it for later and stores it in a database. So all of your text data is taken in, chopped up and stored by similarity within your database. You're then able to prompt your model. When you put your input in, it's going to chop that up in the same way and vectorize it and see what's similar to it and then bring that data back and then provide you with a appropriate completion using any data that was in the database if it's appropriate. So this is a very useful and popular way of adding more data to your models and giving it access to more things. A super simple example of this would be to get around the limitations of GPT-3 only being trained up to 2021 data. Say you wanted to train it on some new Wikipedia data, you could scrape all the Wikipedia data, put it through a semantic search vectorizing function, put it in a database, and then whenever you query about that specific Wikipedia article, it would go, okay, I'm looking for something similar within a database, and we'll look for it pull it back and give you an answer that a normal GPT-3 model wouldn't because of its data and time limitations on what it was trained on. Now, if you guys would like a little bit more information on semantic search and how myself and others are using it in large language model applications, then I can do another video on it if you'd like me to. So let me know in the comments below if you want some more information. It is a little bit technical, but I'm sure you guys can handle it. Another option you have to get these models access to more data is by allowing your large language model of choice to interact with a database. One of the many functions of large language models like GPT-3 is a natural language to SQL query because of this ability to translate natural language into a SQL query, we essentially are able to take a natural language and then get access to any information in a database of our choice. This is typically done with libraries like Langchain, which allow you to essentially chain together different operations with different models for different purposes in order to get a specific output. So Langchain allows you to take in some input, take that input into a SQL query, perform that SQL query, get the data back, manipulate that, and then translate that again into natural language and then give that to the user. So a lot of things hidden behind the scenes, but something like Langchain allows you to take in the natural language and convert that to essentially a database query and get it back to the user. I'm actually working on a project right now with a client of mine who came to the channel. Myself and my development team are working to get a, a database lookup system that takes a natural language queries a database and gets appropriate responses back in natural language. So it's definitely possible. I'm currently doing it and I really, really recommend this for numeric data because semantic search can't really handle numeric data this database method can. If you have any burning ideas that you'd like to have a chat to me about in terms of assessing the feasibility or planning the development out, or just get my thoughts on the idea in general, then you can book a call with me down below. It's in the description and in the pinned comment, my consulting link. So if you'd like to have a chat, then you can reach me down there. Now, both of these methods are really, really awesome ways for you to extend the knowledge of your large language models. And once you combine it with libraries like Langchain, you can start to make some really, really complex applications. And it's really important to understand how fine tuning fits into all of this. Creating fine tuned models that are great for a specific task can be so important in building these larger applications in Langchain, et cetera. So if you have a fine tuned model that say, like we used the example earlier, that takes in the resume data that's unsorted and can sort it, that is a, a sort of key step in structuring data that you could then pass on to different parts of your application. So keep in mind that fine tuning can be a very, very crucial tool when you're looking to build your applications because these models are so powerful. If you can make them more powerful at even one specific task, they can really bridge between different parts of your application and sort of take data from one form and, and convert it to another so that you have, can sort of connect it all together and make a really, really powerful application at the end of the day.
Now regarding land chain, I will be making a video on it next week. So make sure you're subscribed and you hit the bell for that because it is absolutely crucial that you as an entrepreneur understand land chain so that you can begin to sort of frame up what you can do with these language models when you connect them together in a chain. Once you understand Langchain as an entrepreneur, you're going to be able to see opportunities that you just didn't know existed before. I better wrap it up here, but that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope I've been able to clear up some myths and misconceptions that I definitely had at one point, and I'm, I really hope I've been able to clarify things for you because understanding how fine tunes fit into the whole ecosystem is very, very important and not spending too much of your energy expecting to get something out of it that it simply can't do. So as always, if there's anything you'd like me to make a video on in the future, please let me know down below. If you have any questions about what I've gone over in this video, comment down below. I'll be replying to all of them. And if you're looking forward to seeing the next one, please subscribe to the video, hit the bell so you don't miss it and leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Really, really helps my channel. That's all I ask of you. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.